can you actually grow new brain cells? Brand new research has compelling new answers to this question. I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter. This is the Get the Stuck Out podcast. And if you care about your brain, make sure you're subscribed because we're doing deep dives into the most important topics around brain science on earth. Let's jump into this question of can you grow new brain cells? For decades, scientists have debated this question of can humans, specifically adult humans, grow new neurons in their brains? This is a concept, a term called adult neurogenesis. Usually people have thought about the idea that as we get older, we pretty much have a relatively set number of neurons. And when we lose our neurons, we don't really get any back. But a major new study in the journal Science provides some of the strongest evidence to date that we can continue to make new neurons well into adulthood, particularly in the memory critical part of the brain, which is called the hippocampus. These types of findings don't just shift the century old perspective on human brain biology, but they also create incredibly exciting possibilities for how we can enhance brain health across our lifespan. And it's just really empowering research as it relates to the knowledge that regardless of what age you're at, you can grow new brain cells. So let's talk about this study. This new research was looking at brain cells from people all the way up to age 78. And I know this is a popular question, which is, can you only grow new brain cells up to age 78? That is not what they looked at here. They only had data points up to age 78. So when they were looking at basically these brain cells, they were looking for growth of new neurons. They used advanced imaging, sequencing, machine learning. And what they found is that certain type of pre-neuron cell called a neural progenitor cell, these are the cells that turn into neurons, remain active in the adult hippocampus, even into people's late 70s. I think it's important to understand that this isn't some sort of a widespread phenomenon in the brain. These new cells were seen specifically in the part of the hippocampus or the memory center of the brain called the dentate gyrus. So why does this matter? The first reason it matters is because the hippocampus is a part of the brain that is seen as critical for memory, learning, emotional regulation, and mood. And neurogenesis in this region, in the hippocampus, has been linked in animal studies to improve learning, to more resilience to stress, and to mood regulation. If we look at this research and put it into context, and if neuron production continues into old age, it suggests that our brains, the human adult brain, has the opportunity to not just improve in terms of function, but also to improve in terms of structure. This is a big shift in how we look at our opportunities around brain health. The emerging picture of this type of research isn't just that the brain is growing new neurons, and I should say it isn't that the brain is growing new neurons across the entire brain, but rather that if there is a chance for us to grow new neurons, that it could have biological significance in terms of brain health. So let's talk about what this research really means for brain health. The idea that humans, that adults can grow brains throughout their lifespans has huge kind of implications in terms of conditions like depression, cognitive decline, and certainly dementia. So the exciting part of this research is it's confirming that we could potentially intervene to promote the growth of new neurons and that we don't lose this ability of neurogenesis once we enter adulthood, even if it does slow down to some extent as we get older. So the question that I will always get is, Great, we learned we can grow new brain cells. What can we do to support this process? And I will be clear, this study that was published in Science doesn't actually test any interventions. It's none of that, it's preclinical data in terms of it's not looking at how to promote the growth of new brain cells in humans. But we have lots of data, mostly in animals, but a, a little bit in humans, suggesting that there are certain steps that we can take to help stimulate the production and the growth of new neurons. So here are some of the most evidence-based ways to promote neurogenesis. The number one, in my opinion, data point that we have in terms of what we can do to promote the growth of new neurons is going to be exercise. Multiple studies have shown that exercise increases production and survival of neurons in the hippocampus. This is primarily, again, from animal research, but that this also includes older animals. How does this work? Exercise boosts a molecule called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. This molecule is thought to be a key fertilizer for brain cells, and it's thought to promote the growth of new brain cells. 
Research over the last decade shows that healthy humans who started exercising show benefits or boosts in BDNF levels. And this has been found for aerobic exercise as well as resistance exercise. There was even a study a uh, little over a decade ago showing that when healthy people started exercising, they actually grew the hippocampus and actually offset the rate of brain related atrophy in the hippocampus by about one to two years. So how does exercise help to promote neurogenesis? One is it promotes blood flow. Getting more blood to the brain, generally speaking, good idea because you get more access to molecules like BDNF for your brain cells. They also just get more oxygen, more growth factors beyond this. And so exercise improves blood flow. Exercise also regulates inflammation. And importantly, inflammation seems to suppress the growth of new brain cells and the connections between new brain cells, aka neuroplasticity. Exercise also promotes metabolic function, which is another important variable. We know that metabolic dysfunction can tend to decline in people as they get older, and this is correlated with higher rates of developing conditions like dementia, as well as having atrophy in the hippocampus. So what do you make from this information? Shooting for about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise is a good place to start. I would recommend also including two to three days of resistance training a week because resistance training may actually be one of the best ways to boost certain muscle derived signals called myokines that may help to promote neuroplasticity and potentially neurogenesis. Number two factor that you can use to help to promote neuroplasticity and potentially neurogenesis is food. So nutrition, the food that we eat influences neurogenesis through a number of different pathways. Again, inflammation, antioxidants, metabolic substrates. But what we know is that certain nutrients in our food may have an outsized significance. I'd like to highlight two of these. One are polyphenols. Polyphenols are plant nutrients found in things like coffee and tea and berries. They seem to, at least in a preclinical setting, support neurogenesis. And in a observational setting, we know that people who eat a diet that is richer in certain types of polyphenols seem to have lower rates of brain decline. And in a recent interventional study, a diet that was rich in polyphenols seemed to slow the rate of decline, specifically looking at the atrophy within the brain in healthy people. Next group would be omega-3 fatty acids. These are found in plant-based foods as well as animal-based foods. The most important of these as it relates to promoting potentially neurogenesis, but certainly neuroplasticity would be DHA and EPA. Those tend to be more concentrated in seafood-based sources. Something to consider, especially if you're a vegan, is making sure that you're getting enough omega-3s in your diet, which if you're a vegan, you're not. So you should consider supplementation. You can get an algae-based form, so you don't need to be consuming animal-based products. And then third step in terms of nutrition, Generally speaking, a minimally processed diet. I'm a big fan of the Mediterranean diet. I know that's pretty vague, but it's a diet that is rich in healthy fats, healthy fiber, uh, plant predominant, uh, less red meat, more seafood-based diet. These are the types of diets that have been linked to improvements in terms of neuroplastic pathways and could potentially help to benefit neurogenesis. Conversely, you want to eat less of an ultra-processed diet. So if it has added sugars, if it's been heavily processed in terms of ingredients in that food that you don't know about, if you've lost a lot of the healthy fiber, that's probably something worthy of avoiding. There's also some research around things like caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, uh, specifically in animal models. I'm a little bit concerned about the relevance of what that represents for the average person, especially because, you know, unless a person's really being cautious around this, doing some sort of a long-term fasting can actually promote potentially some other liabilities and stress pathways within the body. So I think it's important to be a little bit more cautious around those things as it relates to neurogenesis and neuroplasticity, even though we do have some pretty interesting preclinical data, meaning before it got to humans, showing that these things could potentially improve brain function. Now let's talk about sleep. I'm always talking about sleep, and the reason for it is because sleep is one of the most powerful ways that we can dramatically and very quickly regulate brain function. What we know about sleep is it's very important for metabolic regulation, meaning that it clears out metabolic waste from the brain. It's also key to memory formation, but it seems like Sleep is a key timing specifically for neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. So generally speaking, the goal here would be to get as much quality sleep as you can. That's seven to nine hours on average of quality sleep per night, trying to stick to a regular sleep schedule. 
I will say there are many things you can do to improve sleep, everything from waking up at the same time and going to sleep at the same time, decreasing blue light exposure at night, dropping your bedroom temperature to a little bit cooler to allow your body to get into that good sleep earlier, not eating before bed, so many things. But if you struggle with sleep, I highly recommend talking to your practitioner about it. Generally speaking, sleep key to this. Number four in terms of tools that may help to promote neuroplasticity and neurogenesis would be making sure that you create a life that is cognitively enriching and where you keep learning. Uh, there's lots of data on how keeping your brain active may help to promote basically long-term brain health, helps to create connections between neurons. There's really not too much in terms of human data showing that neurogenesis occurs with these types of things, but I still think it's a great idea. So. Uh, basically anything that creates some sort of a learning opportunity that could be learning a new language that could be learning to play music that could be learning new skills that could be traveling these are things that activate your neurons and similar to what we think about for muscles where if you don't use it you lose it i think this is a great representation of how engaging in regular mental challenges can help to promote potentially the growth of but certainly the regulation of a healthy brain the last thing i'll mention here in closing is stress management is key so just like inflammation can decrease the production of things like BDNF and the availability of healthy neuroplasticity and potentially neurogenesis, stress also appears to be toxic when it's at high levels or chronically sustained for healthy neurogenesis. So what do we do about this? Chronic stress is a part of life for many people. There's a lot we can do around chronic stress to mitigate its effects. That includes everything from seeing a psychologist to getting into nature to exercising to uh, basically just doing some mindfulness each day. But the bottom line here is any step you can take to help to decrease chronic stress is going to be promoting of neurogenesis type pathways. So putting all of this together, uh, again, I'll just say, if this stuff is interesting to you, if you're interested to learn about the science of how to grow new brain cells, how to protect your brain, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast. We're gonna keep doing these deep dives into the science. But the key here for the takeaway would be that we know we can grow new brain cells across our lifespans and certain things that we can do each day can dramatically promote the pathways involved in the growth of new brain cells. So everything from the sleep that you do or don't get to the quality of your diet to engaging in some cognitive challenges every day, these are great opportunities to help to promote the growth of new brain cells and general brain health. So again, my name is Dr. Austin Perlmutter. This is the Get the Stuck Out podcast. If this was interesting to you, share this with a friend. It's very helpful to me. And also let me know what you liked or didn't like about this episode. I look forward to continuing to bring you this science-based content, and I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks for watching.